Greetings and welcome to the Read to Inspire podcast. I am Sibongi Seni Mkolozeli. Today I am joined by the author of this book, So You Think You Want to Buy a Franchise. His name is Richard James Edwards. Just briefly about him, Richard James is an accountant with more than three decades of experience. He has qualified as an ACCA in the UK during the year 2000. He has worked in a variety of industries in various countries. In 2014, he and his wife bought a business. In 2016, he and his wife bought a franchise. This is the book they both wish they had read before they bought their franchise. Richard, thank you for joining me and welcome to the Read to Inspire podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. All right. So the first question for me is basically, we are more curious about how people started their reading journey. So to cut it short, basically, I want to know, when did you start reading books outside of academia and why do you think reading is important? I've, I mean, I've always been a reader of books uh, ever since I was a kid. And um, this was actually my first business book. Uh, before this, I was actually writing uh, children's books. I was actually writing fiction for children, which uh, is is a real passion of mine. And I, I was, I think, as we all were, inspired by the J.K. Rowling story and the Harry Potters. But even before then, I was reading things like... Um, Tolkien and Enid Blyton and the Hardy Boys and uh, mm-hmm. so th- throughout my life I've, I've always read books and I've, I've always enjoyed reading books mm-hmm. there's, there's no doubt for me that the reading is so important uh, nowadays I mean not only does it help in- increase your vocabulary uh, it also is it's so good for your cognitive skills for your imagination mm-hmm. and um, concentration as well I think um a long-term concentration for reading a book is, is significantly ahead of, of using your cell phone, for example. Mm. So the, the benefits there are, are, are great. And um, it, it's really important that I think that more people read more of whatever it is that they're interested in. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I love that. I mean, you've mentioned... <laughs> Thank you. Okay, absolutely. You've mentioned that you have started reading a long time ago and it's evident the fact that you are you have your own publishing company you have your own bookshop i want to ask you to tell us briefly about 10 10 the page how did it start and what is the vision behind it right thank you very much so i actually so my publishing house is called beyond the veil oh. and i started that so when I came to South Africa in 2015, I, I started writing. Okay. Um, and it, it was to, to fulfill a creative desire within me to, to give me an escape from the day to day. And and it was something that I really enjoyed. And I got my first book published in the UK and I wasn't happy with the job that they did. So um, as I continued writing, I, I started uh, to self-publish. Mm. Uh, I got to meet a lot of people, um, a lot of authors, editors, cover designers, and and people who sort of helped me along the way. So, um, so what happened during COVID, during the lockdown, was I actually lost my job uh, as an accountant. Mm. Um, so I decided to do something more interesting, something that I, I found uh, more interesting, which is when we started Beyond the Veil Publishing full time. So. So not only self-publishing my own books, I'm publishing other people's books. Nice. But, but before then, I, I, when I published my first two books, so I used Turn the Page Distribution as a customer. Mm. So I wanted to get my books into exclusive books and bargain books. Um, so I, I researched all the different distribution companies, came across Turn the Page. Uh, and this was about five years ago. Um, I, I started using them to distribute, and I was I was pleased with with the results that I got. And um, I, I met the owner then, a lady called Claire Rose, okay. and we kept in touch throughout um, throughout the time period. And I was going to release some more books and do more distribution. Mm. And as time go as time went on, we had conversations, and she was looking to to spread her wings in another direction. And uh, and about two years ago. Uh, I came on board as a, as a partner and she showed me the ropes. Mm. 
Mm. And then in April last year, she went off to to do her own uh, to pursue different interests, and uh, I took over full time. So, so since since April 22, I've been running Turn the Page full time, okay. and we've got something like 220 titles on the go at the moment, active and live, mm. um, which we uh, we are distributing out to uh, to as many bookshops as we can. And helping as many self-employed, uh, self-published authors as we can to get their books into the bookshops. Fantastic. Now, before we get into your book, can you maybe tell us how can people who are looking to publish their own books as well as use your services for distribution? How can they contact you, and where are you based? Ah, thank you very much. So, if you're looking to publish, uh, please drop me an email on info at beyondthevailpublishing.com. Mm-hmm. And that's I-N-F-O at B-E-Y-O-N-D T-H-E V-A-L-E P-U-B-L-I-S-H-I-N-G dot com. Thank you so much. Got it. So you think you want to buy a franchise? <laughs> yes. Who or what inspired you to write this book? Well, so um, so when my wife and I came to South Africa from the UK, Well, my wife came back. She's originally South African, and we went to live in the UK for a couple of years after we got married, and we came back, and we were looking for a small business at the time. I was um, I was working as an accountant for a big business, and my wife wanted to start doing something herself, and I was actually looking for something to do, um, yeah, something to do ex- in, instead of being an accountant. So we had a look around various different businesses and and did some research and and like I said on my back cover we did actually have our own business in in the UK before we came so so we we decided to go down the franchise route and um, yeah and that that's that's basically what we did so we we had um, we had some savings that we had and and we invested those in a franchise. I see. Let's start with the most important question: What is a franchise? <laughs> okay, so there are so many franchises. You probably use one almost every day without even realizing it. So, a, a franchise is essentially a business whereby the, the the people who invented the business then give you the rights to use their name and their intellectual property in setting up your own business. Uh, so, for example, uh, let's take um, Spur, for example. So Spur, uh, way back when the, the guys who founded Spur set up their own menus and their own branding, mm. and now for for a fee, then you can uh, set up a Spur franchise using their branding and their and their name. So you get to benefit from everything that they've that they've worked so hard for to build up from the past. Mm, absolutely. And I think you have an experience in both owning a business as well as owning a franchise. Let's look at the yes. points of each, and perhaps so that our viewers can decide for themselves which one is more appealing to them. Y- yes, and, and I, I did write the book with to try and be as impartial as possible, mm-hmm. uh, because there's no right answer for everybody. It's it, it very much depends upon your own yeah. your own circumstances. So. The, the, the advantage of a franchise is is you get a brand, you get a well-established brand that people are very familiar with. Uh, for example, I mean, again, using Spur as an example, people see the Spur logo, they know what they're going to get. So you do get that familiarity. Yeah. You get all of their expertise. They know how to set up a kitchen. They know how to recruit waiters and so on and so forth. And so that's that's very much the upside. I, the, the the downside is of course um, the lack of flexibility. You can't um, put a, a curry on the menu, for example, if you want to at, at Spur. You've got to stick to their rules and and their regulations, and obviously you've got you're bound by their quality standards as well. Yeah. Um, and, and of course their pricing. So uh, their their menu pricing will be the same, and and you'll have to stick to that. Um, so that's that's really the disadvantage of, um, of of having a franchise, and of course, you have to pay for the for the rights to use that name. You have to pay a franchise fee. You you have to pay setup costs. 
Yeah. Uh, but you do get an, you effectively get an instant business, uh, a business in a box, if you like, with a, with a very well-known brand name. Yeah, yeah. So the, I mean, the advantage of setting up your own business mm. is, is you've got complete freedom to do what you want. You can sell what you want to who you want, how you want. Mm. Uh, you can develop your branding in your own way. You can set up your branding exactly as you want. You can set any location you want. If you want to go and work in, if you want to set up a business in Cape Town or Durban or, or Joburg, you can go there. Mm. There's no restrictions to that. You, you are your own boss. Yeah. Um, of course, the disadvantage is nobody knows who you are to begin with. Uh, n- nobody knows why they should come and come to your restaurant rather than go to Spur because, uh, and and that's it's really the time frame there that's the massive disadvantage. And of course, you've not got the knowledge and unless you unless you're from the industry, then you, you've got to build up a lot of knowledge very quickly. You've not not just in terms of what you're going to sell, but where you're going to buy it from, how you're going to produce it, mm-hmm. and and what and the staff and, and everything else. So, so it, it really is a, a time lag with setting up your own business, and of course you don't have that brand recognition. So, mm-hmm. so that's uh, that's the disadvantage of setting up your own business. Yeah, beautiful. And I like the fact that in your book, in your book, you explained in details both the disadvantages and advantages of each. So I urge yeah. all viewers to go and get the book and get more information <laughs> about this. And I like the fact that you mentioned research in the beginning before you went into business. Buying books, that's part of the research. You need to do your homework. And that also informs now the next question, which franchise to buy? <laughs> <laughs> that is an excellent question. An excellent question. Uh, there's no real right answer for that. My uh, my advice is do something you're passionate about and do something you've got some knowledge in. There's no point getting a, a tiger wheel and tires if you don't know how to change a wheel. Uh, if you don't care about <laughs> about being a mechanic, then that's going to be the wrong the, the, the wrong way for you. It, Mm. there's so many different uh, franchises in almost all business sectors that you can actually find something that you're passionate about. Mm. My advice is also to find something that you use regularly. Yeah. Um, so it, it, whatever, you, whatever you choose should be something that you yourself would use. Mm. Mm. All right, I see. So since you say you need to go into something you're passionate about, I call myself a foodie. I love food. And my favorite franchise, <laughs> also being patriotic as a South African, I love Nando's. So do you right. think having to love a specific brand like their food and the taste and so forth can also be part of the decision that influenced you to go for that particular brand? I think in business in general, you've got to do something you're passionate about. So I think you're absolutely right. I think if you're looking to do a food franchise, and your favorite food is Nando's and you're passionate about it, then I definitely think that would be the right avenue for you. Okay, great. Now, let's say I went into the franchising side. I don't want to start my own business. There are options either you buy an existing one or you build your own from scratch. Which one is more appealing? Or maybe let's look at the advantages and disadvantages and advantages of each. Yes. Okay, well... So if, if you're going to buy an existing franchise, obviously you're you're going to be limited as to who is selling their existing franchise. Okay. So you're going to be limited in terms of your location. Mm. And also you need to be asking yourself, why are they selling their franchise? Mm. Is it because um, is it because they've got a bad reputation or is it because maybe the mall is closing down or or, or there's a, a, a multitude of different factors why somebody is selling? They might be emigrating. They, you know, they might be retiring, for example. Mm. Uh, you know, these are valid reasons um, as to why. But you you are going to be limited in terms of your location. Mm. Mm. But what you're going to have if you buy an existing franchise is you're going to have all the infrastructure. Okay. And, and again, if we stick with the restaurant model, if if you're looking at Nando's, you're going to have all of the the cooking equipment you're going to need. You're going to have the restaurants already going to be there. You're going to have experienced staff. Uh, who are used to to dealing with the customers. And, of course, you're going to have an existing customer base as well. Mm. So um, 
if you're looking to buy a new franchise, I mean, what you're going to have is you're going to have brand new equipment, which is going to be great because you're not going to be having second-hand equipment. The fridges might be broken down and the three hobs on the cooker might not be working. Um, you, you're going to have the opportunity to recruit and train new staff from scratch. Uh, so the staff aren't going to have the experience that the other staff are going to have, but then they're not going to come necessarily with the baggage. And there's always a, a big worry that um, the staff, well, nobody likes change, let's be honest. So with a change of ownership, the staff, there might be some resistance from the existing staff. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if, if you're buying a new one, you're also going to get the choice of locations. Hmm. Although, obviously, you're not going to want two Nandos in the same mall. So um, there's going to be slight restrictions about that. But hmm. in terms of your geographical um, your geographical um, location, hmm. uh, you're going to get a certain amount, of, a certain degree of choice over that, of course, depending on whether there's suitable uh, empty units to, to rent. Hmm. Hmm. Um, but, I mean, you, you know, you will get the freedom of choice, uh, which is great. What you won't have is you won't have an existing customer base. Mm. So even if you open your, your Nandos with your, your gleaming new equipment and your well-trained staff, okay. if nobody knows it's there, then you're going to have uh, you're going to have no business. So there's going to be a certain amount of marketing you're going to have to do yourself, uh, even, even with a franchise, mm. um, especially with a new franchise, just to let people know that you're going to be there. Okay. And let's say you see a gap in one of the big malls, in, let's say in Pretoria, where I'm based. Mm. Let's say how much capital do you need to have as a budget, whether you want to go for to buy an existing one or a new one? Let's, let's speak roughly, specifically about Nando's. So, okay, so if, you, if you're buying a, a, a new one, mm. uh, so... You, the things you're going to have to think about is you're going to have your setup costs. So you're going to have to buy all the equipment. Mm. And, and it's not just cookers and the big stuff. You're also going to have to buy menus and seats and knives and forks. Mm. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of things you need to think about. Okay. You're also going to need money to put down a deposit for the rent. Now, most of these malls are going to ask for at least a month uh, as a deposit. Mm. And it's not just going to be the basic rent you're going to have to pay. You're going to have to obviously pay the VAT on top. Mm -hmm. So uh, normally these malls will quote you the exclusive VAT price. Okay. So whatever price they quote, you're going to have to add immediately 15% on top. Mm -hmm. Then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to stock your shop. So you're going to have to buy all of your opening food and drink. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, that's obviously a huge cash outflow at the beginning. Yeah. Um, so if you buy an existing um, existing uh, franchise then most probably there will be some stock there which the uh, franchise owner will sell to you mm. but again it's still going to be a cash outlay up, up front so it's not just the cost of buying the franchise that you're going to have to think about it's it's your rental deposit and it's your opening stock as well mm. okay good and what i found in your book is yes. that there are several options you can look into in terms of financing your franchise, whether going for a business loan, whether using your savings, etc. For a, which one would you basically recommend? Would you recommend like a healthy balance of those or go for one? Like what is your recommendation there? Yes. Have, so when we bought our franchise, we used our savings and I would definitely recommend against that. Okay. Uh, because... If it doesn't work out as you plan, then then you are going to have to restart from scratch. Okay. Um, obviously, using your savings is the cheapest way to do it because uh, any loan is going to come with interest. Mm. Um, any investors are likely to want to take a portion of the business and a portion of your profits. Mm. So using your savings is the cheapest. I, I think you're right to, to try and get a balance um, of loan and and savings and um, i as, as a rule of thumb if, you, if you're going to get a loan get a loan for something that's um you always try and finance a loan for something that you've got so my advice is to is to, to get a loan to finance the the tangible assets the the cookers and and that kind of thing and then use savings to to finance the the stock and the and the rental deposit so um and that way your your loan is is against your assets that's mm. that's what i would recommend 
I see. Now let's say your business is running. How much, how do you know that you are in the right track? Like let's talk profit. How much profit are you, you should you should you be making annually in order to know that you are in, in the right track? That's an excellent question. Um clearly if you're leaving a job with a salary then you want to be making ideally as as much profit as you were making in a salary okay. um, otherwise you've taken a hit on your earnings and then your own uh, personal lifestyle will will take a hit mm -hmm. but i mean i mean really you need to be making as much profit as going to is going to cover your own personal expenses whatever that might be you might have a bond or rental yeah. Um, so you need to be making a living for yourself. You have to be able to pay your own bills and, and you know, get in your car and make sure you've got enough petrol to drive to the mall to, to, to run your franchise. So yeah. you've always got to be making sure that you are making enough money to survive. That's that's the bottom line of it. Mm, mm, I see. Before I read your mm. other business books, they recommended, I think it's one, not not many of them. I read somewhere that you need to be basically making double, let's say your salary was 20, 20K a month. Your business mm. should make a profit of double that amount. It should be 40K or more so that it can maintain your lifestyle as well as flexibility having to um, save, let's say for a rainy day in case something bad happens in the, in the yes. business, we have a backup. So I think even your recommendation, having to have like a profit, which is the same as a salary, I think that's also good. Yes, and you're absolutely right. I mean, with business is business is inherently risky. Mm. Uh, if you don't get clients coming in for whatever reason, then obviously you're not going to be making any money and you're still going to have huge amounts of costs to pay. Uh, so, so running any business, whether it's a franchise or your own business, you are going to need to make sure that you do build up a cash reserve, obviously, to to cover if if anything uh, any uh, downturns do happen. And of course, um, specifically a, a Joburg problem over December for for restaurants is, of course, a, a lot of people actually leave to the coast. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, December is especially a, a quiet time for restaurants in Joburg. So it's always worth bearing that in mind. Yeah. I never saw that. I never thought about that until I read your book. So it's quite it's actually an eye opener. I got so much yeah. information. You actually rekindled my passion of owning my own franchise one day. Oh, excellent. <laughs> now, as an accountant, Richard, uh, please tell me what is the gross profit and why is it important? <laughs> gross profit. Okay. So when somebody comes into your shop and they buy something and they, they spend 10 Rand, mm. that 10 Rand is your turnover. Some people call it revenue. It's the same thing. Okay. Um, some people call it the top line number. So that 10 Rand is, is your earnings. That's how much uh, revenue you've made. Okay. Now, if you sell, um, so if they come in and spend 10 Rand and they buy a glass for argument's sake, mm. if that glass costs you three Rand, and uh, then your gross margin will be seven rand. So it's your turnover or your revenue at 10 rand minus your costs uh, of three rand, which gives you seven rand. So, so your gross margin would then be, uh, we like to express things as percentages in the accounting game. Mm. So your gross margin as a percentage would be seven divided by 10, which would give you a 70% gross margin. I see. Okay, pretty simple. I think I didn't have an idea in your book, you even do this simple calculation, even so for someone like me who's not into accounting, at least they understand why <laughs> by turnover, by the less cost of sales, by gross profit and all those things. Yes, and of course, uh, yes, an accounting, accounting profit is very different from cash flow, which is something that a lot of people, um, I think not accountants struggle to understand. Mm. Um, especially when they get their accounts back from their accountant and they're, and they're showing that they made a lot of profit and, but they've got no cash. So, so sometimes it can be, it's, it does get a lot more complicated than that. I see. And apart, let's say from revenues or profit, what determines if buying a franchise is a good investment? <laughs> That's a very good question. Mm. That's, um, so obviously we've got the cold hard finances. Are you making a buck at the end of the day? Mm. Um, secondly, I suppose 
you, you look at the sort of the soft, the softer uh, parts of of running a business. Is it, are you enjoying it? Mm. Is it fulfilling? Yeah. Are you learning something? Are you growing as a person uh, by doing it? So, I mean, for for me and my wife, we we had a lot of uh, scenarios that we weren't. Um, experienced that um but what we did grow very very strongly so for example dealing with staff uh dealing with customers when things went wrong uh dealing with suppliers when they couldn't deliver on time the things that we needed to give to our customers so although although our franchise was ultimately not successful financially in terms of in terms of our personal growth it was incredibly successful Okay, and then there are some other factors to consider, some of which we have touched based on them already, things like rent and stuff. There's also electricity to consider, there's water, there's taxes, you mentioned VAT in the beginning. But from your annual turnover or your annual profit, you still have to pay a certain percentage to the franchiser, if I'm not mistaken. Can you explain that bit? Yes, you're absolutely right. Now, the, the franchise fees vary from franchise to franchise, and I can only speak with certainty about the franchise that we owned. Mm. And so the franchise that we owned charged us uh, 6% of our turnover. Um, so if we uh, turned over, and again, I'm talking the money coming in the door. So if we got uh, 10,000 Rand that came in the door, mm. at the end of the month, we'd have to pay... Uh, 600 rand over a six percent over to the the franchiser and that was just for the rights to use the name and the uh, and the in intellectual property that came with the franchise we also were charged uh, two and a half percent which was called for marketing which was a marketing levy mm. uh, which was supposed to go towards obviously building the brand in terms of uh, nationwide marketing um I don't think we ever got our money's worth on that. Um, so, in effect, eight and a half percent of of every every rand that we made went straight out the door to the franchise. Or, yeah. Okay, I, I get it. You just mentioned like a few like uh, something about IP. Can you highlight the importance of having to look or look for an IT and exp expect in terms of running a business? So, I mean, yes, I mean, the, the, the IP, and, and again, when you buy the franchise, you're buying the IP, and, and the IP can be something as simple as a recipe. Mm. Um, so for Spur, for argument's sake, it could be their pepper sauce recipe. Yeah. Um, because when Spur was founded, somebody invented that sauce or developed that sauce, and now the recipe for that sauce is owned by Spur, and, and you get to use that recipe uh in return for obviously paying your franchise fee so again that's that's part of the intellectual property and of course the the branding is the biggest part of sort of what we call the intangible um intellectual property so it, by intangible i mean something you can't physically see or touch yeah um so the, the, the spur logo is 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 something that people will see and then associate that with with a hopefully a pleasant memory of eating some nice food there mm. so it, in yeah, in terms of intellectual property, uh, again, for a franchise, that's really what you're paying for. You're paying for the, 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 the way they've developed the menu, the way that they've put the, the recipes together, uh, even the combinations of the ribs and, and chicken combinations or whatever it might be. That's, um, that's all a sort of intellectual property of the franchise all. Mm -hmm. Oh, I get it. Now, before we move forward, let me take you a step back to your previous point about the franchise fee. In your book, there's a part mm -hmm. where there's like low margin of 1% and then the high margin is between 7 to 8%. I think in your franchise, you mentioned you paid about 8%. So those franchises with a low margin of 1%, which ones would they be, for instance? I'm... That's a very good question. I honestly don't know. Um, like I say, when when we did our research, they, the oldest, all, generally speaking, the food places are very similar uh, in terms of what were well, their franchise fees. I'd say anywhere between four and six percent. Mm. Um, um, 
Yes, my, my advice is to do research. I'm, I'm not, um, I, I'm, I don't want to say one thing and be wrong on that one, unfortunately. Okay, I understand. But yeah, I mean, look, the, the, the lower the franchise fees, obviously the greater chance that you can make money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but then, then obviously you need to be asking, and it's like anything, it's like, am I paying a lower fee? Am I getting a lower quality product? Am I, uh, am I buying, uh, you know, people pay uh, expensive premiums on things like cars, for example, because of the quality that they get. Um, so, and, and again, that, that, that goes through most walks of life is you pay more, something more expensive to get a better quality product. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Let's talk about VAT. We spoke briefly about it. Yeah. In your book, I laughed. Actually, I made this joke in my mind when I learned that Hungary <laughs> is the country that charges the most VAT. And I was like, in my mind, <laughs> is it because they are hungry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then the differences between different countries. I understand there are various dynamics. Maybe you can highlight if you know any. In SA, I think it's 15%. In the UK, 20%. In the US is ten percent. Like, why? Why so much differences? Oh, okay. Now, again, we're talking uh, macroeconomics now, so we're talking very high level uh, uh, government revenue and and spend, and a lot of it is when VAT was released in the UK, and I, I it was released before I was old enough to know anything about VAT. It was seen very much as a stealth tax. Okay. It's something that you pay that goes to the government that you don't realise you're paying. It's not, it's not a number on your pay slip whereby you get um, you get a salary and then you you have tax deducted. It's it's something that you go and buy, and then of that thing that you buy, then the government takes fifteen percent. So it was seen very much as a stealth tax in the UK. Uh, it was seen as a way that the government could increase their revenue uh, without uh, annoying too many people. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that's what happened in, in general, but uh, I remember the sentiment in the UK was, was very much like that. Okay. So, I mean, the, the, the way it works essentially is that, is that most things that you buy will have VAT on um, in terms of um, well, food and uh, books, for example. Books have uh, VAT on. So of the sale price of a book, mm -hmm. uh, whatever you pay at your bookshop, then... Uh, 15% of that is doesn't go to exclusive books or bargain books at the end of the day it goes to to SARS mm. and and that's obviously that's going to be the same way that your franchise will, will run um, so that everything that you take 15% uh, of that is actually not yours it actually needs to go to SARS mm. um, but then what happens is that the, the money you spend uh, if it has VAT on, then you can deduct that VAT that you've spent from the VAT that you've taken in and you pay over the net. Mm -hmm. um, that's the you don't have to register for VAT if if your turnover is less than and I think it's a million rand at the moment, but I could be wrong on that. So but I, ideally, as a business owner, you want to be turning over more than a million rand a year. Mm, OK, now we're talking. <laughs> minimum should be a million rand correct <laughs> well I, I and and, it, and again it's going to depend on what your gross profit margin is oh yeah so remember if if remember turnover is your top number it's the money that's coming in before any deductions of anything so if if it's if it's costing you uh 70 percent to to make that million rand then that's only going to leave you with three hundred thousand gross profit so again, the gross margin is so important because it's going to be your second biggest number. And it's also the number that you want to try and uh, reduce as much as you can. The other important term, which I believe is also important to know, is break-even number. What is break-even analysis? Let's start there. Yes. Break-even is, is a fantastically useful tool. It's also extremely difficult to, to calculate. Uh, especially if you don't have any actual numbers. And, and I think, um, I can't remember if we touched on this now, but uh, if you're buying a, a secondhand franchise particularly, you need to make sure you get as up-to-date set of accounts as you possibly can. Mm. So a, a break-even number is, is essentially your value of your turnover at which 
you will neither make a profit nor a loss. Okay. So that is um, that is the bare minimum of, of turnover that you need to make in order to cover all your costs. Oh, I see. So mm. Mm, then once you've got that number, mm. so, sorry, um, well, once you've got that number, then what you can do is you can do really useful things like work out how many customers per day you need to get in through the door and what their average spend must be. Mm, mm. Oh. So then you can really start tracking your performance. Yeah, once you know how much you need to break even, then you can see what you're actually doing and, and see whether you will be breaking even. Okay, perfect. Is what is your take in terms of this advice that you know most be- people are very successful in business? They recommend that mm. someone it doesn't. Let's say, for instance, myself. I come from the agriculture background. I never did anything that is related to accounting. I have no clue whatsoever about law. Would you recommend that? Yeah. Let's say I don't maybe go for like a short course in law, a short course in accounting. I should get hire a professional accountant and get myself a lawyer so that when it comes to drafting contracts and things like that, at least there's someone who can basically verify and make sure that everything is basically, I'm on the safe side based on those things. Yes, I I do agree with you. I mean, the, the law is is so important. It's, it's not something I have a great deal of knowledge about. Um, I've certainly read a few contracts in my time. Mm. Um, but it's, it's when you're in business and you are signing contracts, it is extremely important to know what it is you are signing and what are the possible pitfalls and, and the things that could happen that uh, the, the layperson might just not, uh, not see in the contract. Mm. Um, so I would, I, I, I tend to be of the opinion that I would rather get somebody in to do, do it for me. Mm. Uh, that's my personal opinion. Um, Simply because I I would rather focus my attentions on 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 other things on on running the business. I would rather get somebody. Although I mean, don't get me wrong, lawyers can be expensive. Hmm. Uh, I would rather get somebody in with a great deal of experience and a great deal of knowledge to look at that for me. Yeah. Um, mm. now, when it comes to the accounting, so, sorry. Uh, no problem. When it comes to the, <laughs> When it comes to the accounting, I, I definitely think you should have a little bit of knowledge to know what it is you're looking at. Mm. Um, a, a good accountant can help you and can advise you. Um, and, and also a, a decent bookkeeper. Mm. And but bookkeeper and accounting are, are, are different um, they're different things in, in, the, in a similar industry. So your bookkeeper will be looking at your day-to-day invoices uh, where your accountant will have a much more higher level view of your numbers. I see. So, uh, yeah. But I, I think a little bit of knowledge can really help. Although, you, yeah, I, I personally prefer to to get an expert in, especially if there's something I don't understand. Mm, mm. All right. I think that's what I was leaning towards on even myself. Now, Richard, mm. I believe since you said you have started reading early on in your life and now you have a publishing company, a distributing company and a bookshop. I want to know which two book titles or three book titles that have made a significant impact in your life. Okay, that's a great question. My favorite book of all time is A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm. Um, So it is crazy English sci-fi it's the one book that I can read over and over again, and it still makes me laugh, even though I've read it so many times. Wow. So I I think that's a fantastic book. Um, and I, I think, so, so the second, probably the, 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 the book that's had the second biggest impact in my life has actually been uh, the first Harry Potter book, believe it or not. Wow, okay. That, um, that, that, really um, opened my eyes in terms of actually I think when I first read that I thought I, c- I could write something like this as well and I thought this is this is very nicely written it's, it's a lovely story mm. and that really um, sowed the seeds that I would use in future to to start writing children's books of my own mm. 
Okay. Any other last one, or is just that two is basically? Was it, was, was it three? Sorry. Sure, <laughs> um, um, oh, I, I read so many books. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, since you mentioned, <laughs> I think two is okay. Since I said two or three book titles, so that two is okay. okay. When you mentioned The Hitchhike to the Galaxy, I've never read that book, but I've heard that Elon Musk read that book by the time he was nine years old. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. That, that was fascinating for me. And I think one of the things that I've noticed when it comes to these super successful people, one of the habits they develop at a very young age is the habit of reading books. And one of the reasons I started this podcast, my vision actually is to see each and every African home with a bookshelf. And as long as that bookshelf is bigger than a television screen, I am happy. And, and our mission Brilliant. really, our mission really is basically to promote now the reading culture within the African continent and beyond. So it's basically the point of studying to expose your children to books. When you have that bookshelf at yes. home, it becomes easier for the children to be addicted to the to, to to the books basically or to the culture of reading. So the first point is just make sure you have those books and then it becomes easier for the kids to read. So when I read these stories, the Trevor Noah's, the Elon Musk, the Oprah Winfrey's, one thing that is common among them, they were exposed to the culture of reading at a very early age. But this is not mm. only to say if you are not exposed to reading at a very early age, it's never too late. My case, I started reading books outside of academia in the year 2014. And that habit on its own has dramatically improved my life. And you've mentioned the benefits of reading earlier on. I agree with each and every one of them you've mentioned it, but there's still more. But um, now that we're still talking about books, my next question is also about books as well. Since you're in business, I just, I just want to find out from you, what books can you recommend? for someone who wants to start a business or buy a franchise? Someone who starts to start a business. Mm. So I mean, we're distributing a, a, a very good book um, called a Why Do Small Businesses Fail? So I, I think it's really important to, 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 to read the back of the book and, and see who the author is yeah. and see if you can connect with their story. And then I think you'll have an actual um, an actual trust to, to, the, to what they've actually written. Uh, there's certainly a lot of different um, uh, books on there on, on about starting your own business. Mm. Um, my advice is to read as many as you can. And uh, I, I absolutely guarantee that six months worth of, of, of reading books, mm. even if you only take one one idea from each book, it is going to save you potentially thousands and thousands of rands by the time you're actually ready to to start investing in your own uh, business, whether it be a franchise or anything else. So, I would definitely recommend to to look out for Why Do Small Businesses Fail uh, by Colin Luwami. Uh, so that's a book we're distributing through Turner Page as well. So, um, but but yeah, uh, any book by any. Any author that you can connect with and own respect, I think, is is gonna is gonna resonate more with you by the time you read it. So I think that that would be my advice: see somebody yeah. um, you like the look of and, and and learn from their story, whether it be somebody really famous like like Richard Branson or mm. or, or you know obviously Donald Trump, not when he was the president, but Donald Trump, the businessman, yeah. um, to see how they made it, or Elon Musk, of course. See, see how they made it and um, yeah, learn from learn from their mistakes as well. There's, I'm sure there'll be stories of how they, they messed up as well as uh, how they succeeded. Absolutely. And it's, I get the idea that we should lean more into autobiographies. As you were speaking, I remember that just last year I read the book by the founder of Starbucks. The title of the book oh. is called Pour Your Heart Into It. Something along those lines. His name is Howard Scholes. So that's yes. the book I would recommend. And I had to borrow my other friend who wants to start her own business one day. And when it comes to franchising, mm -hmm. I never read a book before that speaks directly, focus on franchising. So I'll definitely recommend yours. This is a book that is easy to read. You can finish it within a week. But for me, because it was so interesting, 
within three days I was done and I took so many notes made so many highlighting in the book I was like this is going to be yeah. for me and when I'm ready I will refer to it again so that I know exactly right. what I'm and obviously apart from reading books I also recommend that people should watch this podcast I mean they are great podcast now especially in America whereby these podcasters bring in business people to share their journey if you don't have much time to read these autobiographies go yes. watch the my favorite now is the diary of a ceo and you get to watch oh. i think yeah that guy is very brilliant in terms of sourcing you know these big moguls and people who are very experienced in business so it really really helps if you want to start a business to do your research read books watch podcast and also, you know, having to consult with people that you know and you trust, like you've mentioned, it helps a lot. Yes, absolutely. If you can find somebody to work as your mentor, then uh, that's really, uh, that's the golden ticket, to be honest, uh, to, to learn directly from somebody who's been there and done it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we, when it comes to reading, Richard, you know, reading is part of education, right? There's formal education and then there's informal education. And I think in our education system as a kind, of, actually in most part of the world, we don't really emphasize much in terms of the reading part, like the informal part. Let's say you had the power to influence our education system in South Africa. Mm -hmm. What would be your recommendation in order to make our education better? Oh, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, kids do need to read and they need to um, to, to get off their phones as, as much um, and, and do start reading. Mm -hmm. And I think first and foremost, you've got to find something that's interesting for the kids to read. Otherwise, they're not going to read it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I think there needs to be a significant investment in, in uh, books for kids, uh, whether it be entertainment or whether it be uh, uh, learning books, um, they need to uh, in invest into into libraries. Mm -hmm. I think we need to get uh, almost brand ambassadors around to these schools who you know, people who the kids will respect. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be an author; it could be a sports star mm -hmm. or or somebody that the kids will relate to and look up to, and somebody who can teach them the benefit of reading and and, and show them that they read as well. Yeah. And then I think that the kids will will take that on once they. See see somebody that they respect uh, reading. Mm. Uh, I think that's what we really need to do. But I think first and foremost, we need to get more books into schools, Yeah, uh, books that the kids are going to be interested in. Mm. Um, and like I say, it doesn't matter what those books are as long as they're interested in reading them. It, it, I, I, I don't think kids need pushing into reading one thing or another just because somebody thinks it's better. I think uh, every single book has an advantage to the kid who wants to read it. And, Mm. I think that's that's the important part. I think, um, and also, uh, if you don't mind, yeah. I've started a creative writing competition. Uh, so this year was my first year. Uh, oh, wow. do, do you mind if I plug this? Yeah, please. I'm putting please. you on, on the spot. So uh, this is the first book. This is the South African Schools Creative Writing Competition. Mm -hmm. So this is an initiative that I've started um, because I saw a need to get schools to uh, to write creatively and to encourage their students to write creatively as well. So mm. I, I set up a competition and um, the the winning uh, entries get their, their stories published in, in my book. So okay. that's uh, something that I'm trying to do, that I'm trying to take, take on bigger and better next year. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great initiative. Do you have a website? Maybe as part of this episode, you can share that link if people want to enter. And maybe when is the yeah. deadline for the competition for entering? Okay, so so the deadline, well, we've just announced the winners for the 2023 competition. So I'm going to um, update the website for the 2024 competition. I'm going to um, decide what categories um, I'm going to issue. Okay. Uh, but the website is SASCWC. Okay. .co.za hmm. so that's the South African Schools Creative Writing Competition um, so the deadline for entries will be uh, May next year and then I'll be doing the judging during uh, June July and then hopefully get the winners announced by next year July so uh, the, the 2023 competition has, has just finished okay. um, like I say that's uh, that's the book that we've published okay. um, so yeah I'm really hoping to get more schools involved 
Okay, let's hope all, all the best with that. And let's hope there will be more schools indeed that are involved so that we can, you know, really create in different ways that we can this culture of writing as well, because without writing, yes. we'll never have those materials to read. Now, exactly. Last exactly. question for me, Richard. Where, how much is your book? And you've mentioned basically you have a, you, your publishing house and your bookstore. If someone is not in the province, how can they get hold of the copy and how much is it? Right. Okay. It's uh, it's 175 rand. Uh, I have been distributing this so that uh, some exclusive books and bargain books do have it. Okay. Uh, but the easiest way to get hold of it is to order it online. Mm -hmm. uh, and I use a company called Dot Dot, okay. D O T D O T, okay. And the the book is available on there. Okay, uh, great. So that's uh, yeah. Dot Dot okay. Dot Dot. Okay, to make also a dot, dot. easier, I think I will also type during the in the description of this video of this episode so that people just click and then it will take them straight to the website. Perfect. I'll, I can send you the link to the book as oh, well. Brilliant. That will be brilliant. Okay, that's it from me, Richard. Thank you so okay. much for your time and thanks to the listeners as well, to the viewers. Thank you for supporting the channel. Please subscribe below so that we ensure that we grow. So the more we grow our community here, the more we spread the word, not only in our, Af in our country, but in the African continent as a whole and even beyond our borders in the continent. So thank you so much. Until next time. Cheers. Thank you.